Thank you, Warren, and good morning, and Happy New Year. Uh, we are in the book of Proverbs, and we are trying to finish the 18th chapter. We begin with the 20th verse this morning, and I have four or five Proverbs. We'll see how the time goes. Uh, to get into them this morning. And hopefully uh, we will be back to our normal confines soon. And I'll get my drums back. Uh, <laughs> I'm missing my music. Here is uh, Proverbs 18.20 as we begin our study this morning from the fruit of a person's mouth, his belly is full. I'll make a comment about that word. I really translated it full twice. Uh, that is a very literal translation. His belly is full, and from the harvest of his lips he is full. 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it, each will eat its fruit. So what you have in 20 and 21 are two proverbs about communication, about speech and the use of speech and our tongue. And then here is 22, and it is domestic. One who finds a wife finds good and obtains favor from the Lord. 23, the poor speak, and I translate this pleadingly. We'll look at that word. But the rich answer rudely. And 24, our final proverb, a person who has unreliable companions is about to be broken. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs, or what I think that they are teaching, uh, to help us along as a guide to think through them. Uh, 20, the speech that comes back to the wise will leave its mark. The speech that comes back to the wise will leave its mark. That's really the word full. I'll get into that. Uh, 21, the skill for living uses the power of the tongue for effectiveness. The skill for living uses the power of the tongue for effectiveness. 22, she is the abundant life for the believer, the good wife. She is the abundant life for the believer, the good wife. 23, the wise in life know what to do. The wise in life know what to do. And finally, 24, God is the sole source of your all. God is the sole source of your all. One thing I would like for you to do is set a tab at Genesis 29. I want to show you something from a text there that will supplement our study this morning. Well, here is Proverbs 18, beginning in verse 20, from the fruit of a person's mouth. Now, I want you to read this proverb closely. Notice I have translated the word full there twice. It's really the idea of being complete, satiated, full up, 
And it has the idea of permanence to it. It leaves a permanent mark or reminder. It has a permanence to it. That's the idea. So the wisdom here, whatever the righteous says to impart to others, will in fact fully impact him as well. It's the idea that the righteous are individuals that other righteous people feed off of. Follow, if you will. That would not only entail their speech, that would entail their daily walk. We are reminded of the apostles' words, follow me as I follow Christ. We think of the proverb, walk with wise and you'll become wise. You see, we're always communicating good or evil, life or death. And role models, people of influence, they have their way on us, don't they? Leaving one with these words from the fruit of a person's mouth, his belly is full. It leaves its mark. Mouth here, the, the human instrument, fruit, would be the message itself. Now, we have a figure here with the belly. Your translation has stomach. It's a, it is a poetic device in the inspired language that is a part for a whole. The part of the body stands for the entire person or the attitude of a person. Here's an illustration. We say, that person keeps him under his thumb. Well, it's the figure of a thumb, of course, but we don't think of the thumb being literal at all. We think of what that means. It means he projects power. He projects his personality, his life over another person. That would be the thumb represents the attitude, the life of the individual. So it is this use of stomach here, a part for the whole. But now look at this. We go from the figure of fruit, which would represent an orchard to the image of a grain field. We have mouth previously, now we have lips, which is exactly parallel to the mouth. Again, it's about speech. It's about communication. What we know is fruit can be good or it can be rotten. So to the harvest, spoiled if not taken, at the right place, at the right time. Now, the application is straightforward for the instruction in the home. The child is raised by the parent, taught wisdom, and now they go out and venture into the world. Will they take that wisdom with it? Or will they let that precious instruction rot. That's the idea. Now notice the repetition full again. Line one and line two. The effect, what you put forth, good or evil, you, you will be given it back in full measure, good or evil. Now I thought that was striking because that was Mark's lesson to us last week. The Sermon on the Mount, when he concluded about criticism. The way you criticize others, it will be criticized to you. The way you measure it out, it will be measured back to you. The idea of all of this, of course, is the greatest joy for a parent is to see his children walk in skill, wisdom. And all that that entails See, you may be a surgeon, an accountant, an engineer, 
a lawyer, and your child may very well take up your your ability to uh, earn a living. They follow in your vocation, we would say. Uh, I go to a blood specialist a couple of times a year, and this lady's son graduated out of about 20 hours of pre-med from Georgetown University. And before the plague, going into his second semester, his freshman year, he had already picked up a research fellowship at the university hospital. He wants to be like mom and dad. He wants to be a doctor. They're both doctors. And I know that they're so proud. She talks about him all the time, and she should be proud. But here's the point. Being smart is not being wise. That's not what we're talking about, the skill for living. Brain power is not wisdom. Here is wisdom, Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord. Your relationship to the Lord. That is the Old Testament equivalent of fear. Fearing God. Righteousness is the life that we're called to both in the Old Testament and the application by the power of the Spirit to the New Testament believer. And what is that? Disadvantaging yourself to advantage others. Being a servant, that's it, that's skill, that's wisdom, and that's what brings the parent the greatest joy to see his own children walking in wisdom. And the proverb declares, as we have discerned and given it out, so we will receive it back. Now that may very well be in the providence of God. You have to wait. You have to pray for your children, teach their, your children, and oftentimes they spin away, don't they? They go nuts on you sometimes. But look at the proverb again, full, leaving its mark. Think of all those days and months, those years that Jacob had to wait to actually see Joseph's face again. And as a bonus, here's the mark, the permanent mark. He got to see not only Joseph, but his grandsons Ephraim and Manasseh as well, and he adopted them as to his own sons. You know, the Apostle Paul would call that Ephesians chapter 3. That would call that a double portion blessing, or that would be Paul's words, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. That's Paul's word. And that's the mark that's left. So keep teaching, keep praying. As a parent, as a grandparent, the Lord will use you in the lives of other believers. That's the proverb. Here's 21. Death and life. Isn't it amazing how many proverbs are about communication? I hope this is teaching us to be careful with our speech one to another. This proverb, verse 21, so close to the previous proverb. Here the effects or visitation of one's words, the consequences of the way one speaks. There is an interpretive question here in line two. It is the word it in the English translation. Those who love it. It refers to the tongue. It refers to speech. The proverb talks about the power of communication. Look at the parallels. Life and death. Tongue and fruit. Power and love. All parallels. This opening is rather extreme, isn't it? Life and death. Communication 
for every providence. First, the deadly tongue. It disrupts, it fractures, it hurts, it disheartens, even bringing one to hopelessness, death. Whereas the tongue of life, it creates, it builds up, it adds vitality to its possessor. Speech here in the top line declares are in the power of. You see that? Meaning care, authority of. Proverbs 18.21, the power of or the power over. Now let me show you where that is used in the Old Testament so you see a clear picture of it. It was Abram's words to Sarah regarding Hagar. Genesis 16.6, your slave, he says, is in your power, under your authority. Your New American Standard translates it, in your hand. And the same phrase in Genesis 39, where the warden of Pharaoh's prison paid no attention to how the jail functioned on a daily basis because Joseph distinguished himself and thus, here's your word, was given power, authority on and over that jail, that facility. This phrase indicates the influence that the tongue produces. See, the tongue is never neutral. One must determine how to use it for good or for evil. We want to be effective communicators. That's the idea. To my mind, there was never a more eloquent preacher than Haddon Robinson, right here in this auditorium. And he was, was like listening to Pavarotti. There were things that S. Lewis Johnson would say in his sermons that just, they were like a bolt of electricity going through me. It wasn't the southern drawl, it was the force by which he said something. And there was probably not a greater orator in the Western world than the great Winston Churchill. He worked very hard to transform himself into a public speaker. He didn't have a particularly attractive voice. Before the plague, I was in Colorado. And I would go and meet this guy who was also a bartender, but he ran the cash register, and I was constantly purchasing things. So I would strike up a conversation with him. After about three days of visiting with him about this and that, and where he was from and his family and so forth, I said, what are you doing here? Oh, he said, well, I like to ski. I said, well, you're missing your calling. You're voice is for television, radio. I mean, this guy was amazing. Uh, James Boyce referred to George Whitfield one time as having an apparatus. That's what he called his powerful voice. He was able to speak to thousands upon thousands and they could hear him from a great distance. Well, that's the idea here. Uh, Churchill didn't have that. He talked in monotone without much change in pitch or volume. He had a speech impediment. He couldn't pronounce the letter S. But he understood the power of words. Spoken and written, and he saw the effect that they had on people. Thus he set about the task of working hard on his oration. Each will eat its fruit, says the proverb. What you determine to do with your voice, your communication, it's up to you. You can build or you can break. What are you aiming for? What's the end result 
of you speaking out when you do. I can tell you things that Howard Pryor or Charles Howard said to me that are just as clear in my mind as if they had just spoken them seconds before. Let's work on our communication. That's the proverb. Here's 22. One who finds a wife finds good. Unmistakably, the wife is like the skill for living, wisdom itself. How do I know that? Proverbs 8.35. Proverbs 8.35, the one who finds me, wisdom, finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Now look at this. One who finds a wife finds good and obtains favor from the Lord. Unmistakably written exactly that way. Now when I started working on this proverb, I sent a text to my son and my son-in-law, and here's what I said. If you want a happy marriage, you get up every day and see how you can serve your wife. The true leader is the servant in the household. The Lord, Jesus taught us that in the upper room when He washed the disciples' feet. That's Matthew 26, 14. So that was my counsel to them. Look at this opening verb, to find. Now here's where the proverb gets a little complex for us. It has, this first to find has both a vertical as well as a horizontal application. So follow me here. Let's think first of the horizontal. That would be you finding. Now how do you do that? How do you teach your son, your grandson? How do you teach them to find the woman of wisdom? Well, you do it by avoiding the wrong one. I'm not trying to be clever. You see, you teach your sons, your grandsons, you find the right one where the right ones are located, where they are to be found. In the church, in the Christian community at large, we are in a pursuit here, the first find, horizontally, for the good wife as opposed to the strange woman. Remember Proverbs 7.25? And here, you remember the verb? The man had to turn into her. We teach you stay on the path of wisdom. You don't turn aside to the right or to the left. And 7.25, the fool, the simpleton, he had to turn aside for her. When my son went off to college, I continually told him, now you're going to meet all kinds of girls out here. And uh, here's what my counsel to you. Go find someone like your mother. Make a list of her characteristics. And you look for someone like that. My son has been married now for over seven years, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my daughter-in-law is from the Lord. She grew up within a mile of our house in Oklahoma City, and yet it was the strange twists and turns of divine providence that brought them together at the Empire State Building in New York. You see, God, in His sovereign favor, sent her to us, showered her down upon us. The first feature of to find is you look where the great women are. That's what we learn. 
which leads us to the second feature of to find. Tell and teach your sons. You may seek and search in every direction, but only the Lord God truly finds. That's the vertical of our verb. Finds. Genesis 2.22, let me remind you that it was the Lord God that brought the woman to the man. He didn't know what he was looking for, but he knew the moment he saw her. And that's why I wanted you to see Genesis 29. I ask you to set a tab there. Very quickly, Genesis 29. This is where Jacob meets Rachel. Now you want to talk about the vertical. Here is the vertical in spades. He'd been on a long, arduous journey away from his family, and he's on his way to Paddan Aran. In verse 9, while Jacob was talking with shepherds. See, it's just, it's just an everyday deal. This is just ordinary life. Look at this. Rachel came. That's all you need to see. That's all you need to hear. God brought Rachel walking straight toward Him. Right in front of Him. Just at the right time. Just in the right place. You see, that's Proverbs. And that's providence. And that's what the book of Proverbs teaches. A word at the right time being in the right place, the warning to stay away from the strange woman. Remember, she comes out. Remember her time? She comes out when the sun is setting in darkness. And the warning is, don't go down that street. Be in the right place at the right time. Look what God just did. See, He was on a journey now let's think about your life. We're all on a journey. And somewhere along the way on our journey, we come to Bethel. That's, uh, that's Genesis 28. That's where God revealed Himself to Jacob. Remember? He is exhausted. He's on this journey. He doesn't know how far to go from this point. And he just lays his head upon a rock. Falls fast asleep. And he dreamed. But God was in the dream. It was the angels ascending and descending that staircase, remember? And he wakes from that dream the next morning, and he's a regenerate man. How do we know that? Because, what does he say? Surely God is in this place. That's spiritual life. That's what took place. Now, just as a point of theology, how does a person get saved in the Old Testament? Well, he's saved the same way in the New Testament. And here's how we know that. Because when our Lord Jesus met Nathaniel at the beginning of the Gospel of John, Nathaniel had been studying the Scriptures. He'd been reading about Bethel. He was the disciple with whom there was no guile, and Jesus knew that. And He said to Nathaniel, you know that dream of Jacob's, that staircase, and the angels going up and down? Well, Nathaniel, that staircase was me. Think about that moment. Think about the reaction of Nathaniel. It makes your heart leap to think about it. I'm the staircase. I'm the bridge between heaven and earth. It's me, said Jesus. The will of God is what Jacob found. You don't need to look for it after you come to Bethel. It will come to you. 
You see, that's the vertical aspect of to find. Now here's the second to find in the proverb, the top line. The result, the result of the good wife, look, it's good. In other words, she's the source, she's the cause of the Lord's blessing in your life. You're an enriched person because of her. Line two, look what she brings to your life. Good things. And they just keep coming like waves on the ocean. They just keep coming. One after another obtains from the Lord the benefits in abundance. You're never, you can never outgive the Lord. The Lord is the source, but she's the means of the blessing. He is the source of your joy, and He brings through her peace and happiness. And now here's what you learn. Genesis 2.18 Man has not fallen. Here he is, pristine. And the Lord God looked at him and said, It is not, and the word from our proverb, good. It is not good for a man to be alone. He's perfect. But the Lord God said, He's incomplete. I'm going to give him a helper. And that's the abundant life that He has promised to us through her. Now here's our final, oh, here's 23. We probably won't get to 24. The poor speak pleadingly. New American Standard transla translates that, utters supplication, but the rich answers rudely, roughly, harshly. Another proverb regarding communication. We leave the intimate relationship of the husband and wife now to polar communication here between the rich and the poor. We've studied together one proverb that gives us a perspective on this subject. It is 1420. The poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. It explains for us the chasm here in our proverb, that exists between the two parties. The rich and the poor. The materially rich in the world is pictured seemingly as having it all. Including relationships that come in abundance. The top line opens with the poor having the central position. Look, speaking. You see that? which is the offset of line two with the answer. The poor speech is defined for us as pleading. The English Standard Version translates that entreaties. New American Standard utters supplications. The root of the word is to be gracious, to be kind, to be merciful. Daniel uses it in his prayer to the Lord in exile. Daniel chapter 9, verse 23. He cries out, Open your eyes! He pleads to the Lord. And see our desolation and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of our own merits, but on account of, and here's your word from Proverbs 18.23, your great compassion. That's our word. To be gracious. It's the plea for requesting compassion from the Lord. When you have no answers in life, and the Lord takes us there often, doesn't He? Does me. And we're overwhelmed with no real thought as to 
what to do next, we plea for His graciousness where we are. It's, this is the poor man's cry in the book of Proverbs. By contrast, we have the abrupt answer of the rich. This word rich translated as strong, powerful, mighty. See, he's got all the answers. It's all in his bank account. It's as quickly as he can sign a check. Proverbs 18.11, the rich person makes his wealth a strong city. Remember, we studied that together. The man rich is depicted as brushing the poor man aside, as if he doesn't exist at all. The plea comes to his ears, but rather than ignore him, he treats him in such a way as to just disregard him. Chase him from your presence. We think of Ebenezer Scrooge you know, walking down that cold street on his way to his house and the, the poor were calling out to him and he would curse them, brush them aside, Speak harshly to them. Get out of my way. And that's what our proverb says. Chase them away. Your translation may have harshly, roughly. But here's what the wise know. Here's the skill that we've learned from Proverbs. God hears the plea of the weak and the needy. He hears them. Isaiah 57, 15. Thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell, he says, in a high and holy place, and also with him who is contrite and low in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. You see, he's interested in listening to the man who calls out for mercy. When you don't have words, I don't even know where to begin, Lord, to tell you my problems. That's what he hears. He hears His sheep. And He listens. God hears. God knows the weak and the poor. And when the Lord came physically to us, He showed constant compassion toward them. His thoughts for them have not changed through all of these centuries. But the means to reach them has changed. Because see, He's no longer with us. He's at the right hand of His Father. So we have to ask, who tends for them? Who speaks for them? Well, here it is. It's the wise. The wise, the people that know the skill for living. They're the ones. Because they know the Word. And they know the importance of these people to our Lord Himself. What does He say to Peter at the end of His ministry to him? Feed My sheep, Peter. Feed them. That's, that's our task. That's our assignment. For the weak, the needy, pray for them. Be engaged for them. And by doing so, you'll be exercising your gift that God's given you in His time, in His place, all for His glory. Well, we're out of time. We won't get to 24 today. We'll, Lord willing, go at it 
in two weeks. Let's bow for a word of prayer, shall we? Thank you, Father, for uh, this study of the Scriptures, the book of Proverbs, as so simple and yet so complex. Uh, but thank you that you are leading us and guiding us by your Spirit. And you are providing for us all good and competent instruction that we may ferret these skills out and apply them to our lives and to remember how we speak to one another and the way we are to look at one another, particularly our wives and their importance in the home. The way we are to conduct our affairs in this cesspool society regarding the weak and the poor. In all these things, Lord, we have heard Your voice. So is Your Word that goes forth from Your mouth. It never returns void. It always accomplishes the purpose whereunto You send it. So use Your Word powerfully in and through us today for the glory of Jesus Christ, our great God and great Savior. Amen.